Fireside Chat Podcast, episode number three, Kipper's Hurt. Recorded February 6th, 2013. Welcome to another episode of the Fireside Chat Podcast. It's Dan alongside my co-host Matt and Lucas. How are you guys doing tonight? Episode Good. three, fired up. We're just minutes after the Calgary-Detroit game, and guys, I gotta tell you, I I personally like my wings mild, and I think that's what we got tonight. Yeah. Definitely, they seem to be missing Nicholas Lidstrom a lot more than they should. Well, he's only a, a Hall of Fame defenseman. Arguably the best ever. I mean, you, you can yeah. you can see where they might. Oh, yeah. Just get some scrub in there and good to go. So what are your thoughts on the game overall? Other than a little <laughs> bit in the second period, they pretty much dominated from the get-go. And when uh, Irving came in in the third period, the, the Flames' defense played rather well and allowed Irving to see most of the shots. So it was a pretty good effort. So let's start off with the elephant in the room, if we will. Uh, Mika Kippersoff got hurt. He didn't come out to play the third period, and as such, Leland Irving got his first minutes as a flame this season. He got six shots on net. How would you guys think the backup was, played? Uh, he was great. He looked calm. Although, I mean, as far as elephants in the room, like usually the elephant in the room has to wait a little bit to be addressed. This was just sort of like Kippersoff. Holy shit, elephant in the living room. He's on the ottoman. <laughs> yeah, he's uh it's all right. It's, well, you know, um, it doesn't help, but it makes things that much more interesting, I think. One thing I noticed uh stylistically from Irving was that he looked very similar to how Jamie McLennan used to look in the net. And he would be, you know, crouched down a little bit and while he made all, all the saves and looked competent, you know, he didn't seem a hundred percent comfortable yet, but over the course of the period, he did get a little bit better. I think part of that too is he hasn't played a lot of hockey. I mean, he didn't play a lot for Abbotsford before the lockout ended, and he hasn't played for the Flames since. But with all that in mind, I thought he looked pretty good for a guy that's really coming in cold in January or February. Oh, it was say. great. He uh, mm-hmm. he didn't have you know. It, it's I I think a lot of times it's easy for for a goalie to just come in cold and not have the time to think about a game and think about who you're playing because you just whatever I got to go in it doesn't matter that you're facing Zetterberg and Datsuk it's just oh I guess well it's, there's nobody else so uh, we heard from the Sportsnet guys and the Fan 960 guys after the game that it was an unspecified lower body injury and I think Lucas you said you had some more information uh, on I mean that. I'm not breaking any news here I saw one thing that indicated it might be a back but it wasn't from any source that could be official and if it's a back injury i mean that sucks but at least it's not it's it, at least it's kipper put his back into it slut so with kipper perhaps on the shelf for a little while that means i imagine irving is going to be getting some starts and who do you guys think is going to back him up are they going to bring up danny taylor or barry brust from the farm team or do you think we go out and find a free agent goalie do you think we trade for a goaltender well, with the quick turnaround, the Flames are going to be in Columbus on Thursday, so they'll likely get someone that they can just fly out there to back them up. Likely it'll probably be one of the Abbotsford guys, but they could also sign one of the unrestricted free agent goaltenders that are just sitting at home. Who would your choice be? I would probably go with Danny Taylor because he's done fairly well with Abbotsford this season, but... It really depends on how severe the injury is. If it's a longer-term one, then perhaps you go and try to find an unrestricted free agent veteran backup instead. Um, I would personally say that I don't even—I don't really even think it matters who they sign. Whoever they bring up for any length of time is going to be. Uh, the practice goalie and an emergencies only type of guy. Um, this is your opportunity to see what Leland Irving is. Uh, there's no, there's no, I guess that there's no more coddling in me as to sink or swim on his own merit. And this is as good a chance as any 
as he's going to have to prove that he deserves to be more than a five, ten game a year guy in the NHL. Yeah, I think you're right. And this is the question that we talked about in the first episode, and that I think Calgary fans have been talking about for a while, is can we finally get a backup goalie that is going to do something that we have some conf- confidence in and we think can move forward as a you know, a legitimate part of this team and not just swap that piece out every couple of years to whoever's the flavor of the week. And I think if Irving could show that he can back up this team and lead them to some wins, I think that's going to go a long way for him. One thing I was happy to see tonight myself was that the defense finally played well in front of a backup goalie, which is not something we've seen in the last couple of years. Yeah, the attention to detail in the defensive zone by all the players, including guys like Aginla, sheltering the puck when it was in the higher traffic areas in front of the net was actually very impressive to see. Definitely a departure from years gone by, for sure. Well, I do think that in as much as the team is horrible when they know the backup is going to play, I think back to a couple games uh, two years ago when Henrik Carlson got into the game and really sort of sparked the team. I think when the backup does get in, Midway through, the team plays with more of a sense of, I guess, uh, urgency or an obligate, or they feel embarrassed or duty bound to make sure that the bleeding stops, as it were. But uh, I think, honestly, um, it might be worth going forward not telling the team when the backup is playing, just to give them less time to get complacent or resign themselves to the fact that they're probably going to lose because. Kiprasov's not there, which I'm not necessarily saying is how they've approached things, but, I mean, proof's in the pudding. Which seems like an odd place to look for proof. (laughs) I think that could have been something with the regime change as well that we're going to see. I think that we're seeing more confidence from this team just overall, and I think that, you know, confidence in front of the backup goalie might come with that as well. Yeah, for sure. Although, I mean... This is, a, it's again, good confidence-building win. I would like us, us, I would like the Flames to beat uh, some teams that aren't the Oilers or don't appear to be reeling from the uh, loss of a Hall of Fame defenseman. Well, the thing is, is that uh, the Flames have been showing a lot more the last few games. Like, that game against Chicago, they dominated right from the get-go. And if it wasn't for Ray Emery standing on his head, the, they would have easily won that game. So, yeah, they're starting to get into really good habits, and hopefully they can carry it on to Columbus and beyond. Can, can I just say... Um... That sentence right there, if not for Ray Emery standing on his head, that's sort of a problem. Like, can you imagine another team saying, wow, if if not for Phil Sove standing on his head, we really would have pulled one over on Calgary. Um, you got you got to beat backups, especially, and you've got to beat backups uh, when you're playing a team that's uh, coming off back-to-back games. And they, I, I agree, they, they were full value for the effort, but... It's just a game you've got to win in in a 48-game season. They did hit a post a couple of times in that game, and, you know, it is the best team in the league that they were playing, so it's not like they were up against some B team. So, you know, unfortunately, it seems that we always tend to perform really great against backups. <laughs> And, you know, I think Ray Emery's a lot different than most backups as well. I mean, this is a guy who used to be a starter. He's not Phil Sauvé. He's not some, you know, no-name backup who just happens to get a start and play a good game. And, you know, even though we lost that game, I think it's important to note the effort the team put in. Because if they get used to putting in a hell of an effort every night, we're going to be seeing good things yeah, happen. Yeah, like tonight. Exactly. Good. That's the exactly. Positive. I like it. Well, talking about efforts, let's look back at the uh, Avalanche game that happened on the 31st of January. And that was a game that the Flames were up and ended up somehow losing 6-3. to three. What are your thoughts that on that, was, guys? I hate blaming a goaltender for a bad performance, but really that was all Kipper, that game. Um, with the 
the shots that he did let in, his reflexes seemed a little bit slow on them, and just that little extra second to get his arm down or, you know, in position properly, and then the puck's in the net, and... That was another game where I think the Flames dominated most of the game and then they just fell apart right at the end. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't as bad as the score of 6-3 indicated, but, I mean, it got away from them at the end. And, you know, Kiprasov's got to make those saves. He's the guy. So, I mean, nothing... It's not like it was particularly devastating personally, but, you know... I assume it was a learning uh, experience based on the way they've come out uh, the last two games. And that's what I I like to see as a fan, especially when you said the learning experience. I see it. They're actually learning something from each game and they're taking lessons away and applying them to the next game. Even though these guys are professionals, there's still something for them to learn. Well, um, especially with uh, how Kipper performed in that game. <sighs> In the preseasons uh, that I've watched before, he always seemed to, his glove hand, he wouldn't catch the puck cleanly, and like his arms wouldn't be 100%, and so the lack of just a couple of preseason games, I think, is screwed with his timing a bit, and you're seeing, you know, like tonight he was a lot better, The he was catching the puck cleanly, and... Yeah, you know, he wasn't a mess in the net, whereas like the first few games he kind of was. Very true. Confidence and comfort do wonders for a goalie. I mean, hell, look at look at Luongo right now. But there's not a more confident goalie in the league, and you know, it, it's t- a, com- a goalie's confidence it infests the psyche of opposing forwards. Like you. Uh, Keep bring it right back to uh, Luongo. Last night, penalty shot in overtime. Taylor Hall was helpless before he even shot the puck. I mean, he like wh- when was the last time you saw a goalie on a penalty shot not even bother going down? Like, that, that's what confidence does. And if we have confident goaltending, the the talent is such with Mika Kiprasov that he can win a lot of games. You know, assuming whatever injury he's having is not uh, too substantial. Yeah, very true. And I think when you were mentioning confidence, to me tonight, Irving looked confident. He didn't look shaky. He didn't look like a guy who was nervous to get his first playtime of the year. And I think that's going to go a long way if he can keep that up to helping him win games for this team. Well, like I said before, like he didn't have time to be nervous. No, it went right from the clipboard right into the net, so... I, th- I feel like backup goalies in the NHL are really at a loss of, like, things to do. Because, I mean, you think about it, backup quarterbacks get to chart plays. Um, what are backup goalies? Do? They, they don't even get to open the door anymore. They just sit there with a hat, and they just kind of try not to talk, I guess. I, like, I, I wish I knew what an NHL backup did watch. during the game. Or besides watch the game. I think that's it. They just watch. You should give them something useful to do. Well, uh, thus far this season, every time I've seen Irving on the bench, he's had a clipboard and a pen. So oh, does he? Maybe they, yeah, so I think Hartley's putting him to work. <laughs> I thought he was playing Sudoku. Maybe. So guys, I just wanted to, t- to take a couple minutes and uh, chat about some of the players and what we're seeing for points so far, unless you guys have anything else to add to that. No. We've got Hudler, who's played four games and has five points. I mean, he's doing better than point per game right now, which is really impressive to me. I wish he would have scored against Detroit just because of the significance of that. And then we've got the captain, who's played seven games, five points, and just got his first goal tonight. How important do you think that goal was? Uh, at any time you can break the ice, it's always good. But, you know, with a Ginla, you don't really have to worry. He is going to get 60 to 80 points over an 82 game schedule you don't really need to worry about him i think hoodler and his line is on a bit of a hot streak right now and i i wouldn't expect that kind of production to maintain over a longer period but 
you know, it's like Weidman scoring his third goal tonight. You'll take it. Yeah, and Hoodler's line mate, Roman Cervanka, only has one point, and it's an assist so far. I'm not particularly worried about Cervanka. He, he does look a little bit like he lacks some explosiveness, but he's in the right place so often that uh, he still makes things happen. And that's the only reason I would say Hoodler, um, that, that's what is going to prevent him from going on prolonged slumps, I imagine, because he's clearly got the skill set and he's getting the ice time, and he thinks the game very well. He knows where to be. He's not uh, getting these points as the result of being, you know, a physical freak and imposing his uh, his physical attributes on the game. He's just he's a smart guy. He knows what to do, and he's going to he's he's where the puck is going. I've been watching the forward core really closely. I was at the Colorado game live, and I've been watching the other games on TV, and I'm really liking what I'm seeing. It seems like a very adaptable and diverse group of forwards. Everyone has their own game, and they can swap in and out of the lineup and in and out of any combination of forwards, it seems, without much effort. What do you guys think? Strong group of forwards this year? Yeah, definitely. And another thing uh, that's helping is the defensemen pinching in just giving an extra little wrinkle to plays being set up. And, you know, like uh, Camilleri tonight, he was up on the first line for uh, a good portion of it, and he set up a couple of goals tonight. So, you know, it's you can pretty much shift any of the top nine guys anywhere, and they should do all right. I agree that you can do that, which, of course, like that's a strength, but at the same time, it's indicative of their big weakness, which is they are a team of second and third line guys. And that sort of, that lack of a true top end that when you run into a team that has, you know, say a Petrangelo or Dowdy or like a, a real stud number one shutdown type defenseman. You know, you are going to be overmatched. I feel, uh, but they they all seem to have a reasonable amount of skill, and it makes for some entertaining hockey. I think that we don't have a big star forward anymore, but I wouldn't say that they're necessarily all second, third line guys. I mean, every first line guy was created somewhere, right? And I think we've got a lot of guys who could be first line guys, maybe not league stars or big studs, but I think we have a a solid first line that can compete with most first lines in the league. Uh, Well, the thing uh, with having so many talented players, how would you say, like, if, say, Stempniak has a bad night, there's another full complement of players that can pick up the, you know, and it allows each line to carry the momentum onto the next shift, and, like, what you've been seeing the last few games is just a relentless attack, basically, because, like, one line will have a good shift, then the next, and then the next, and it just snowballs. And, you know, if they had only, like, I much prefer this kind of a setup instead of, like, having, like, two star players and then less on the lower lines. I totally agree. I would just like to say, though, like, who on the team, or or not on this team, on a true contending team, who is a first-line player? There's a Ginla. And everyone else is fringe first line at best. I don't think, as much as he's having a great year, I don't think Alex Tange is a first line player on a team with legit playoff aspirations. Uh, Camilleri, if you put him with a centerman like, I mean, not, not, not to say that I, like I don't even Crosby per se, but I mean, if you put him with an elite center, like he's a great guy to have i would guess but i would think even the way he's played this year that he's still a second line guy despite what his contract is um and it's not to say that these are bad players it's just that they are i think in many places especially i I do think just that they are playing over their heads being on the first line oh yeah well the thing is is that 
not each player can carry the weight of being the lead guy, but by having so many secondary guys, they can all kind of carry the load. Uh, like, Camilleri, I would say that he's more of a second-line player now. Glenn Cross is a second, third-line guy. Hoodler, same thing. Tange is a fringe first-line guy. And everybody else kind of second- and third-line guys. So, it'd be a lot better if we had, you know, another a Ginla or two, but, you know. I think based on the cards we've been sucks, dealt so. this year, we're doing pretty well with what we've got. Oh, yeah. So we thought that the forward core we just finished saying was pretty strong. It's like a, a good piece of rope, right? Many strands makes it much stronger. But, Lucas, you were concerned earlier today. You were telling us that you thought the defensive core has been pretty weak so far. Do you want to elaborate? Well, I mean, they are physically just a not intimidating bunch, and we knew that going in because we've watched them play for the last two years. And... Right. Maybe not the last two years, ever, even at least since Regeer left. Um, they're not particularly physical, and I understand why Sarich isn't playing, but he completely, removing him negates almost all the physicality of the defense. Now, I will say to his credit, Jay Bowmeister's been playing with a bit of a, you know, burr up his ass the last couple of games, and I, I, I've noticed him frankly falling down more which i like because that means he's doing stuff that could cause him to fall off his skates and you know i I don't think it's a a stretch to say that he's been a true number one defenseman since the oiler game i would say you're seeing florida j bow not calgary j bow thus far this season He's definitely improved. That play, he, uh, in the, I think it was in the first period today when Hoodler just backhanded it into the slot and he just, you know, he split through the wings defense. Like, he, he was going considerably faster than everyone else on the ice and it was a great chance. They didn't capitalize on it, but like that's the sort of thing that, and he scored the same way. He scored the go ahead goal against Chicago that way. Um, that sort of thing. If he gets one or two chances like that a night, I mean, it's not unreasonable, based on the pace he's set thus far, to expect that he could he could crack ten goals even in a shortened season. Yeah. Do you think we talent. finally got our money's worth when we traded Jordan Leopold in the third form? Yeah, finally, after three years and a new coaching staff. If he sustains this, uh, then we'll get our money's worth. Yeah. If he doesn't, then he just had a good hot streak. But to his credit, yeah. I criticized him last week for having not done a single memorable thing in three years. And... He's done memorable yeah, he things in two of the last four, at least. Yeah. One thing I noticed uh, tonight especially was the play of TJ Brody. And he has seemed to come into his own thus far this season. And uh, he was all over the ice tonight, I thought. He was jumping into the play, making good passes, making good defensive plays. So I think uh, that'll end up he'll end up being a good number one, number two defenseman if he keeps progressing like this. Yeah, I agree with you. The other guy I wanted to really uh, highlight, who I think has been playing well, despite what Lucas says about the whole core, but Dennis Weidman. He was brought in to be an offensive power on the blue line for this team, and in seven games he's got six points, two goals and four assists. I really like what I'm seeing out of Dennis Weidman. I do, oh, I yeah. do as well, and I don't think I don't think they're necessarily a, I don't know, an untalented bunch. I just think they're not very strong physically, and I don't think anyone can really argue that. But uh, j- just to quickly go back to Brody, um, I would have, you know, to say I saw him in a top four role, I think everyone would have said that. But to see him just grab this opportunity and assert himself into the top four so quickly is uh, very refreshing and good to see. Well, with uh, the Flames having six defensemen that are all more or less the same type uh, between Smith, uh, Butler, Brody, Weidman, Giordano, and Bomeister, 
I think uh, what we'll end up seeing in the next couple of weeks, perhaps, is a trade with another team that's having issues with mobility on their defense. Butler to Detroit. That, well, we need to get somebody that's more like a better version of Sarich that can be like a physically imposing guy. Just so we have one that's not a seventh defenseman like Sarich. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think that gives us something that we can negotiate with, and I think that's the only piece Calgary's got right now that I'd want to see changed or moved is one of those defensemen. I think the forward core I'd like to see stay the way it is for right now. Yeah, same here. Yeah, I'll agree. I just got a uh, text message from a friend of mine who was saying, you know, if the Flames are short a goaltender, Dwayne Rolison's still unemployed. That might not necessarily be a bad idea. As ridiculous as that sounds. I'd be fine with that. I love Roly. Sign him to a one-year deal, use him, and then trade him off with one of the defensemen to somewhere else. Yeah, worst case scenario. But before the show, we had uh, Matt, who almost killed himself laughing at the Rob Kerr snowball incident during the Detroit game. <laughs> oh, Robbie. Matt, take it away. Yeah. Or, or... Nah. No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Do do we do, do we want to discuss um, Rob Kerr's uh, shortcomings as a play by play man, or should we be nice? Because he's had a rough night. I think I think we should be nice. I mean, we can give him some constructive criticism, but I don't want to bury the guy. Okay, that's that's fair. All right. No, now, first I, I, of all, I'm gonna, I'm going to start this by saying that this that the wasn't snowball his, is that wasn't his fault. No, 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 not at all. Like the whoever's producing that segment or the game itself, you know, maybe, just maybe, you want to open up the package, give it to him on a plate, write him a script. Because he's not hes not an improv, that's for sure. Like, uh, So you're just saying write the man a script, that's all you're asking for, is write the man a script. Yeah, and, and don't make him eat it on air. <laughs> By the way, if someone wants to gif that up and uh, send me and send it to us uh, of Rob Kerr eating... I don't know, a baby, a harp seal, uh, an Edmonton Oilers jersey, um, I don't know, that's a cheeseburger. <gasps> oh, a gif of Rob Kirk eating Ole Jokin and eating a cheeseburger. <laughs> okay, what if we had Rob Kerr eating uh, Tim Erickson? Oh, that's, that's very homoerotic. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way you like it though, right Lucas? Well, I mean, <laughs> hey, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I appreciate hot of all the uh, varieties. Before this goes too far down the wrong path. Fun. No, 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 just let me say, I, I don't need to see that. <laughs> well, we'll hope that if somebody sends it to us then, um, I don't have to look at it when I get the mail, and if I have to look at it, though, you're going to look at it. So I'm sending oh, it on Oh, sure. Here. I'm not, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Fire I just out. don't want this to go too far down the wrong path. So why don't we look ahead at the Flames week. On Thursday night, we have the Blue Jackets on the road. And Saturday night, we've got the Canucks on the road. And then that ends our road stand. What do you guys think? Well, with uh, the Blue Jackets, I was thinking that that would have been the perfect time to start Irving anyway. So that might have been a good timing for Kipper to get hurt. Uh, the Blue Jackets kind of suck. So, which isn't really different from any of the last 10 years, but if they can keep up their style of play that they've had the last few games, they should win, you know, air quotes there, but, (laughs) and against Vancouver, it'll be nice to get another rematch and hopefully it's a similarly good game like last time. The good thing about Vancouver is that we know we're going to be playing Schneider. We're the team you play your backup against. Especially if our backup's playing. Until, until Yeah, and, until, and frankly, until we prove a, we Until they prove otherwise, you know, they deserve to get the backup played against them. Now, they're getting closer to, you know, that not being the case. But So in those two games, how many points do you guys think we walk away with? Two. Four. I'm thinking three. I think we will probably beat the Blue Jackets, and I think we'll probably lose in a shootout to the Canucks. 
All right. I can, I can get behind that. But that's that's just my sense. And then after that, the Flames come home for another homestand. It's such a weird season and a weird schedule. You've got these big chunks of home and road games, more so than usual. Yeah, they play the Minnesota Wild on Monday, uh, the Dallas Stars next Wednesday, and the St. Louis Blues the following Friday. Such a weird schedule. But, you know, I'm liking that so far the Flames have not had really a too tough a schedule as far as the way the games have been scheduled. They've had some time between games, which I think especially with the new coaching staff has helped to reiterate what's going on, to watch the tapes, and to let Hartley work with the team a bit more. Well, especially over the next few weeks, most of the games are against the -the middle-of-the-road style teams, not your elite Chicago, San Jose types. So, it's pretty much uh, the make-or-break time for the Flames Mm -hmm. because it's the the middle-of-the-road guys that they're playing. So, hopefully they get on a roll. Well, they've got to. Otherwise, uh, there's going to be changes. Um, Before we go, there is one thing I'd like to address that's not Flames-related. Did you guys see the highlights of uh, Tampa Philly? All right. Nope. I try to avoid watching those teams, especially the Lightning. Okay. Well, the point is, um, there there was a fight uh, between Zach Ronaldo and BJ Crombie. Uh, Ronaldo won. It was a good fight. Uh, looked like he almost knocked Crombie out on his feet, and then as Crombie was going to the ice, uh, Ronaldo hit him with three more real big shots. And it bothers me when I watch Sportsnet and both Kiprios and whoever the, the guy was who was analyzing on Connected uh, both go, ah, you know, in the moment, uh, I can't, I don't want to, I want to sit on the fence, can't call anyone out, can't judge, cannot judge. We can't judge anyone. And why can't we just be like, look, this was stupid. You know, like, there's no reason to hit the guy twice as he as you've already knocked him out. You've won the fight. So, yeah, may, you may be a useful player. You probably are. Teammates seem to like you. There was a guy at the game right above, uh, the, right beside the Flyers bench wearing a Ronaldo jersey. But you made a stupid decision. And are we asking too much from people who cover the sport to actually... And, and who are paid to give their opinions, to actually have an opinion on something that matters. I mean, we just sat through four months of everybody having a very strong opinion on whether or not the lockout was going to end, or whether Fair was an asshole, or Batman was an asshole. But God forbid you actually say, ah, oh, that was a dick move. And you know what? Zach Ronaldo is a dick. He's done a bunch of things in his career that indicate he is just a subpar human being so call him out what's he gonna it, like and you know what if if i said that to his face and he punched me as if to prove my point there it is Ugh, zach ronaldo you're a dick yeah from the games i've seen him play that sounds about right for the kind of thing that he would do and yeah there's no need for that kind of crap in the not league. at all no, I can't say I've extensively studied his body of work either, but yeah, from what I've seen, when you said it was Ronaldo, I wasn't surprised. No, I, I mean, like, you can be an agitator, you can fight, you can play a role, like, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, the uh, he's he's Steve Downey without the talent. Well, it's like Jordan Tutu, he plays the agitator role, but he doesn't really cross the line. It, yet Ronaldo, he there is no line that seems no, no, with no. him. By the way, are there like aren't there like about a hundred guys you would rather fight in the NHL before you had to fight Jordan Tutu? I would if I were Chara, I wouldn't want to fight Jordan Tutu. He is insane. It's like he doesn't feel pain. Well, I think Bejan broke his nose tonight. So no, did he? And he just he kept going and he won the fight, even though like he was bleeding rather oh, yeah, badly. Yeah, he's a superhero. Maybe Jordan Tutu is a superhero. Maybe he's like Wolverine. He's got metal or something in his bones. Makes him invincible. 
I'm glad that the flames don't. I mean, I've never been a fan of fighting in the game. I understand it has a place once in a while, but especially stage fights, I'm not for. And I'm glad that the flames don't have a paid enforcer this year. Yeah, me too. I, I, we've got some tough guys, but we don't have that paid enforcer. I wish we had someone who was somewhat reputable as a pugilist. Not necessarily a goon, but you know, yeah, your Jordan Tutu type. I would love that. It, it lack we lack that element as a team. Third time, sorry. I don't mean we. I know I'm not on the team. Well, the thing is, is that I actually prefer that. Uh, we don't have one of those guys because we can put out a more skilled player instead and I'd rather win the games than win a fight. Well, I think the fact that Flames are the last team to get a fighting major really shows that too, that it's the last thing on the mind of this team. Yeah, because I'd rather them beat them up on the scoreboard. Really. Two points is more important. <laughs> I've always hated that. When we put out a, an enforcer and somebody's got to sit in the press box because, you know, they can't, we ha- only have so many roster spots. And I agree with Matt entirely that I'd rather put out a skilled player. Sometimes it is nice to have that guy in your back pocket if you need them, but I'd rather yeah. put a skilled player on the ice more well, often keep than in not. Mind, you're, not scratching, you know, you're not scratching Yuri Hoodler for Brian McGratton. You're scratching, I don't know, yeah, Blake Como. Como or Steve Bajan. And they all more or less perform the same. You're not losing a whole bunch of skill. You're just adding a different dimension. And you're also probably screwing up your penalty kill a little bit. But, I mean, it's less of a problem with the lack of uh, goons in the league. But if you had, I don't know, even a George Peros type who can pot the occasional goal... Um, I don't think you're hurt by having that. Now, you're hurt by having a guy. We just get one of our guys to grow a Peros like mustache. Problem solved. I don't think we've got anyone capable of doing that. Kiprasov, maybe. I, we wouldn't even see it behind that mask. Half this team is too young to even grow facial hair, I think. Or too Euro. Euro- Europeans don't pull off the facial hair well unless they're French. Or like they, they go like super shaggy. There's like, I don't know, I feel like there's a, it's an all or nothing thing with with the Europeans and the beards. So guys, over the next week with the games that we talked about on the road, we've got uh, the Blue Jackets and we've got the Canucks and let's even go as far as saying the Wild next Monday. Who do you think are the players to watch? Irving. Probably Irving. I'd like to see more out of Backlund as well as TJ Brody. See if he can keep up his good play. One thing I'm surprised is that uh, we still have Steve Bajan on the roster, but Roman Horak is playing in the farm. I really thought that was going to be the opposite way around. I thought Horak would keep his job here and Bajan would be reassigned to Abbotsford considering well, he's on a two-way. Uh, with Horak, he's getting first-line minutes in Abbotsford, so I'd kind of prefer that because, you know, really five-minute, seven-minute-a-night guy, I'd rather have your veteran there while Horak's getting like 20 minutes because if Horak can actually develop offensive skills where he can be a quality third line guy that can put 40 points up that's preferential than stunting his growth and limiting him to a fourth line role yeah I, I see your point there and I agree with you if he's getting first line minutes I didn't know where he's playing on the farm but yeah if he's getting first line minutes let's leave him down there for a little bit I agree Anything else you guys want to chat about? Good to go. All right, well, let's wrap this one up. It's been another episode of the Fireside Chat Podcast. Lucas, do you want to pimp your Twitter before we go? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, once again, I had no new Twitter followers. So I'm going to say this. Someone tell me, tweet me, that I'm doing a horrible job. Because otherwise, I'm just going to assume, to assume I'm perfect. I'm going to tweet and- you right now and tell you you're doing a horrible job. You please do, and if you want to follow in Dan's footsteps and tell me I'm a horrible hack, uh, you can do that at Luke L U C one seven zero one on Twitter, and yeah, be me- no, don't be mean. Just, Keep ignoring uh, him just so it drives him nuts. <laughs> we're we're gonna make him go nuts, aren't we, Matt? Yep. Matt, anything you want to plug? Nah, I'm good to go. 
All right, well, with that then, why don't we sign off? Have a great week, you guys, and everybody that's listening, and we'll talk to you in a week. Suck it, Tom. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. Theme music, Take the Lead, by Kevin McLeod.